Χριστός ανέστη εκ νεκρών θανάτο, θανάτο παθήσας και της έτης μοιμάσι ζωή χάρη σαμένος. Well, thanks everyone. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. At least it's my end. And uh, hopefully we can get things going smoothly. I wanted to speak to you this evening uh, in the place of Father John, who uh, unfortunately couldn't be here for you, so you have to have me for a second, second week in a row. But um, we're going to speak about the Sunday of the Paralytic, which comes up um, on this Sunday. Um, I'm going to read to us the scriptural passage and uh, a few verses at a time and, and sort of comment on it a little bit different than I've done to this point. And um, basically, I just wanted to mention just a few sort of straightforward things. Why do we celebrate this feast? Well, both the Synaxarian and the commentators on this, like a Blessed Theophilact, who I'll be referring to tonight, um, mentioned simply that uh, a, a large reason for that is because this feast uh, actually, or sorry, this uh, event actually happened in the period between Pascha and Pentecost, um, not in the in terms of the Christian times, but in in terms of the Jewish festivals. And so um, this is one of the reasons why uh, our churches put it there, sort of quite naturally, in the same way that we place Thomas eight days after. Um, or, you know, the following Sunday after the resurrection. So we find something similar here in the case of, um, in the case of this paralytic. Now, I'm just going to begin by reading you the first few verses. So uh, I think you're going to have it put up on the screen. And uh, that's chapter 5, and I'm just going to read you the first, say, well, 8 seven, eight verses. After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been now a long time in that situation, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The paralytic answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So I just want to pause here uh, to make my first point that, I, uh, that, that struck me today and that I wanted to sort of um, pass along to you. The Blessed Theophilact in his commentaries on this um, and in other places too, I'll mention to you from a homily from a contemporary figure, but, you know, says, why does our Lord ask this? Basically, who doesn't want to be healed? In the translation that I read to you, it's, wilt thou be made whole? But uh, what he's asking is, do you want to be healed? And it seems very odd if we think about it, because who wouldn't want to be healed? But the Blessed Theophilact points out that the reason why our Lord is doing this is to show this man's great patience. We already hear in the passage that he's been like this for 38 years. And not only has he been like this for 38 years, he's been sitting in the same spot 
for a very, very long time. And the, the difficulty with him is being a paralytic, as he himself points out, he wasn't able to get himself into uh, the water uh, quickly enough before someone else would hop down into one of those uh, five spots and, and take his place. Now, in terms of a little bit of history about this, uh, it's said uh, in the passage about being in the sheep market. And uh, some of the fathers talk about this, the name of this place being the sheep pool. And the reason why was because uh, what they would do is after the sacrifices of, of uh, lambs uh, in, the, in the temple sacrifice, they would actually wash the entrails in this water. And it was in this moment uh, after this sort of ritual purification had taken place, that uh, there would be seen a movement over the waters, which was understood to be an angel, and the first person who was placed in there would be healed. Now, the interesting thing about this is, uh, and we find this reflected in many of the church fathers speaking about this, they speak about this as being our Lord uh, or God's way of prefiguring for the ancient Jews, um, what what will be um, receive its fullness in holy baptism, but this idea that water is able to cleanse them from defilement, it's rooted very deeply in the Jewish tradition, uh, very early on with all of these kinds of ritual washing. These become things that our Lord is accused of not following. Yeah, they wash the, uh, the, the sacrificial, the, the entrails, and this was a way to, the fathers were, in commenting on this passage, say that um, this was a way for God to prefigure throughout ancient Israel um, the, the purpose of water as cleansing from defilement. This is something that the Jews uh, had made very many rituals surrounding ritual cleansing with water. And so the fathers speak about that, and we see that reflected in this passage. But furthermore, in particular, this particular pool that was able to perform this miraculous healing when the water was suddenly moved and the first person that uh, was put in the water. Now, everything that I've said, or read rather, um, seems to attest to the fact that this was a legitimate miracle that did consistently take place. And that's why so many people waited there. And uh, the Blessed Theophilact and others in commenting on this passage say this was in order for God to attach to this idea of, uh, of water, which is cleansing, also the miraculous power to heal, the miraculous power to transform. And so in this, we would see uh, a clear prefigure, uh, prefiguration of baptism so that when the time came, the Jews would understand and see this as the fulfillment, and that we ourselves, when we read these uh, accounts, would see the same thing. So that's just the, the first bit about that. But um, as I said, uh, what the Blessed Theophilact points out in this passage is part of why our Lord asks this question is pointing out this man's very great and deep humility. Um, because what we, what we find with him, and I'll just read you a passage from the Blessed Theophilact on this, um, but what we find with him is that rather than, as he says here, I'll, I guess I'll just read it, I'm going to sum it up. <laughs> um, so this man who's laying there for a long time, Blessed Theophilact says, yet he never despaired. The only purpose of the Lord's question, wilt thou be made whole, do you want to be healed, was to reveal the paralytic's patient and steadfast endurance. What sick man would not want to be healed? And indeed, the paralytic answers gently and humbly, Yea, Lord, I wish to be healed, but I have no man who can put me in the water. And what's very striking uh, is what the Blessed Theophile goes on to point out about this. He says, he does not blaspheme. He does not rebuke Christ for asking a stupid question. He does not curse the day of his birth as we often do, faint-hearted as we are, when subject to a much slighter affliction than this. Uh, you know, we saw this in the case of the healing of Jairus' daughter. 
um, when uh, you, you have the synagogue ruler whose daughter is dying, and he comes and beseeches the Lord, come, my, my little child will die. And he, our Lord goes in, and all the people have already started the mourning because they've seen that the, the young child has died. And when our Lord says to them, she's not dead, she's sleeping, do they respond with the meekness that we see with this paralytic when asked, do you want to be healed? The way they respond is they start laughing at him and, and, uh, and uh, treating him scornfully. And this is the testimony we see of other people in the scriptures, that they ridicule Christ when he says these things that uh, appear you know, silly uh, according to sort of worldly wisdom. And yet in this case, when our Lord says to the man, do you want to be healed? He doesn't laugh. And rather, he just explains very contently what the situation is. And so, uh, this is one of uh, the, the first things we ought to take from this person, is this idea of patience and perseverance in suffering. How easy it is when we experience a little temptation to start to complain and to moan to God and say, why me? How easy it is to compare ourselves to the lives of other people and say, well, this person doesn't have to suffer this thing, and this person didn't have to work as hard as I did, and this person uh, you know, didn't have to, uh, to, to struggle for the good things that they got or with the trials that I have on me. This is exactly the wrong attitude that we should be uh, exhibiting in this sort of, uh, in case of intense suffering. And all we need to do is think about this 38-year paralytic and his humble and patient and, and meek response to the Lord uh, in order to help to sort of encourage us in, in doing that. Now, some of us might be thinking, again, you know, I gave you a way that we can sort of say this applies to us, but other of us might be saying, well, this is historically interesting, but it doesn't really apply to us. You know, I, I'm not in this, uh, this kind of situation where maybe I have this sort of deep crippling injury in this very kind of extreme sense. But St. Gregory Palamas wants us to look a little bit deeper at the kinds of illnesses that, uh, that one can possess before we jump to this conclusion that, well, I'm pretty healthy and my life is going pretty well, and therefore this doesn't really apply to me. Well, St. Gregory says, anyone addicted to sensual pleasures is paralyzed in his soul and is lying sick on the bed of voluptuousness with its deceptive bodily ease. Once, however, he has been won over by the exhortations in the gospel, such as this one even, he confesses his sins and triumphs over them and the paralysis that they have brought upon his soul. And so we see there's another kind of paralysis, and that's the paralysis of sin and the paralysis of the passions. And forgive me for maybe putting it bluntly, but none of us are going to be free from these, or none of us are free from these, you know, in, in some form. And, uh, and if we happen to, to be people that, that actually are, pray God, there are some of you in the room that the rest of us can learn from. Uh, a person who's uh, achieved this kind of purification from sin feels that they're the most sinful person. So in either case, they're still going to take the lesson of this paralytic to heart. And so I think that's important for, for us to remember. St. Gregory continues, just to add something that I just want us to keep in the back of our mind a little bit. The paralytic is taken up and brought to the Lord by these four things. We'll hear what they are. Self-condemnation, meaning humbling of ourselves. We don't want to sort of get confused what we mean when we say condemning ourselves. It's this idea of humbling ourselves, putting ourselves in our place. Confession of former sins. Promising to renounce evil ways from now on. And finally, prayer to God. So basically... What you could say is self-recognition, this sort of, in, rather than self-condemnation or but this humility, self-recognition, recognizing how we already are. A, a full confession of our sins. If there's things that we're holding back 
that we're ashamed to bring to, to our confessor. Uh, we have to find the strength uh, through looking at the example of this paralytic who was 38 years you know, bodily uh, crippled and think maybe there's things that we have that we're spiritually paralyzed about, that we can take the courage um, to bring these for healing to the Lord uh, through our confessor. Um, and, and this all-important thing, it's one thing to go confess your sins, but as St. Nicodemus points out, sins confessed with the intention to go and commit them again aren't actually remitted when the, uh, in your confession. If you commit sins that you intend at the moment when you're confessing, you know that you're going to go, not that you, that you fear that you're going to go do it, but that you've already decided you're going to go do it. Those sins aren't remit, and so it's very important to have this promise of renouncing evil, uh, and not just that we've gone to confession and therefore I'm clean and I can build the slate back up again. It doesn't work that way. And then finally, the thing that will seal this and protect it and, and remove this paralysis is to keep close to this physician of our souls and bodies through prayer to God. By keeping him close, keeping his grace there, he continues to keep our... Uh, these uh, newly treated wounds of our sins and passions from becoming infected, from festering, uh, and in some cases even becoming worse. So this passage has everything to say to us, whether or not we have physical uh, affliction from the Lord or physical illness. Now, I just want to again call our attention to this the question that our Lord, now that we see that, uh, thanks to St. Gregory, that this passage in the Scriptures applies directly to us. I want us to reconsider this question that our Lord asks. Do you want to be healed? And we can easily think, well, who doesn't? Even the fathers sort of point that out in commenting on this, and it seems like a strange question. But there's this wonderful little homily by... Um, Father Simeon, who is um, he's a spiritual father in a monastery outside of Thessaloniki. Uh, and in this homily, he brings up this point where our Lord says, Do you want to be healed? And he says, Do there exist people who don't want to be healed? And he says, Yes, there do exist such people. He goes on to say, Aren't we all sick before God? In particular, from the perspective of of the wounds that sin has inflicted within us. That is, from the perspective of our souls and our sinful state, just what St. Gregory told us. God asks all of us, do you want to become well? A person may be able to say, I am a sinner, and yet the Lord still receives a negative answer to his question. He receives the answer, no, I don't want to be healed. The position of the sinful person is, yes, Lord, take me to paradise, hold me close to you, but don't make my old man suffer anything. Let's let him come too. Is it possible for sin to enter par paradise, asked Father Simeon. Of course not. But the old man is mixed together with sin, so he needs to die in order for the body of sin to die within us. The Lord is not afraid of sin, he is able to heal you. Once he enters into you, sin will die. Remember, our Lord is like, not only is he the physician and the healer, he himself is the medicine. And his very presence will cast out sin, will destroy sin, and will heal our souls and heal those wounds. But in order for him to come, he wants your consent. He wants you to say, yes, I want to become well. This means precisely that you assent to the death of the old man, to our sins, to our passions, to these inclinations that are so difficult for some reason for us to let go of, these small little pleasures that we don't uh, want to give up in the face of this, uh, this peace and, and, this, um, and this glory and this transformation that's being offered to us. We need to ascend to the death of the old man, the body of sin, and to the death of all these things which we are accustomed to in this life. Passions, faults, weaknesses, bullying, imperfections, grumbling, complaining, fault-finding, 
And Father Simeon will even say, and even the things we consider beautiful and good. Meaning, sometimes, many times, the sacrifices we make in order to be healed, in order to draw close, are not sacrifices of things that in and of themselves are bad, but that in a particular situation for us, they're becoming an impediment. Or, uh, you know, in the case of asceticism or something like that, or fasting, where we, we willingly give up something good for a time, in order to train ourselves up, in order to demonstrate our love to the Lord, and to test ourselves to, to sort of see realistically where we are. So that's something I want us all to, to think about tonight, and I want you to think about it on Sunday. When you hear the Lord ask this question, don't just let it stay on the page of the Scriptures, but let it penetrate you. Let the question be directed at you. See Christ in the icon gazing at you and asking, do you want to be healed? And if we do want to be healed, then we have to turn and, and make the next step, which is to, to beseech God to help us to do it, and to help us to desire to do it even, and to keep that desire. It's, it's one step at a time, it's one moment at a time, to constantly pray God to continue to enkindle our desire for transformation. Now, I'm going to just continue to read from the passage. This is uh, verses 8 to 13. Now. So we've just heard that uh, our Lord asked him, does he want to be healed? And he says, uh, I have no one to put me in the pool. Jesus saith unto him, Rise up, take thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day it was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Now, uh, again, in commenting on this passage, the Blessed Theophilac points out something I thought was very significant. That in most of the miracles that our Lord performs, we continually see him evoking the faith of the person before he works the miracle. Do you believe? Do you think I have the power to do this? Uh, all of these kinds of things that our Lord asks. Um, but in the case of this paralytic today, we see the Lord asks the question, um, but doesn't uh, require uh, this man to say, yes, I believe that you can do this, or yes, I believe in you, or anything like that. He just answers quite simply, as we said, I don't have anyone to put me in the pool. And our Lord heals him. Uh, and so he says the reason for this is because in the other cases, the people knew who Jesus was, or they had been present for his miracles. They'd heard his fame. But this paralytic uh, who, who was laying here for such a long time, you know, wasn't involved in sort of hearing all these things. And yet, uh, with the same innocence that he showed in initially responding to our Lord's question and meekness, so we see here. He shows this sort of great faith after the fact by, what does he do? He just stands up. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't, again, laugh or mock. He just gets up. And I'll just read you, you know, what Blessed Theophilac has to say about it. He says that, See how the paralytic believed as soon as he heard Jesus' words. He did not hesitate and think, He is mad. I have been here 38 years without being made whole, and now all at once he commands me to stand. Instead, he believed and rose to his feet. And so, again, I think we need to examine ourselves here. If the Lord comes to us, if he says to us right now, if he's saying to you, do you want to be healed? And you said yes. And he says, okay, rise up. Leave your sicknesses behind. Leave your passions behind. How are we going to respond? How do we respond to this kind of thing? Do we naturally respond uh, to these medicines that are being offered to us, to this call to rise with skepticism? Because when I just read that, you know, uh, Blessed Thevac putting words, the words that this paralytic didn't say, but when he expressed them, unfortunately there's a part of me that quite naturally reacted to that, to say, yeah, isn't this how we act? too often? Or isn't that our first inclination too often? 
and and what does that say about us you know and where and where we want to be i guess in terms of our faith and in terms of our relationship to the lord when we hear the teachings of the church that have been given to us for our healing do we respond with skepticism first are we always questioning the things that our tradition has given to us are we always putting it under the the sort of microscope scope of our you know modern ideas or of our uh, you know, of our human questioning, skeptical kind of reasoning or something? Or are we beginning to make the progress where when, when the Lord speaks, we hear him and we respond in faith? Um, so I think that's something else that uh, is very important about this passage that we need to sort of be thinking about and seeing ourselves here in the, in the paralytic. Now, something else that we see and that we see in the in the rest of the passage is how poorly the Jews respond to him. They say, "What are you doing? It's a Sabbath. Why are you, you know, carrying, uh, you know, carrying your your bed?" And in verses 11 to 13, he answered them, "He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk." Then they asked him, "What man is he?" who said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk. And he that was healed knew not who it was, the paralytic that is. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. And the fathers in, in commenting on this, they say, what a marvel it is that this sort of simple paralytic who's responded with such meekness the whole way through, would have uh, the boldness to say to the Jews, even though he knew he was breaking the laws of the Sabbath, the person who healed me told me to do it, and therefore I did it. You know, he didn't make excuses for himself. He didn't justify himself. He answered very simply. And when they, when they further went on to, you know, ask him who it was, he just very simply said he didn't know because the person had left, Jesus had left too quickly. And so the fathers point out that, you know, we ought to marvel at this boldness uh, of this paralytic who was uh, very low in, the, in terms of the social status because he had this great affliction and because so often uh, it was looked at as, you know, that he sinned and therefore that's why he's in this particular situation. And we'll go on to see a little bit about that. I know we're running short on time because of how late we started, but... The other thing to realize, and I'll just read this from Blessed Day of Lacht, uh, because it's so good. He says, um, sorry, the Jews, after he said uh, that, uh, the Jews did not ask him, who is it that made you whole? But who is it that said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? A very important distinction. They blinded themselves to the miracle and were obsessed by what they considered a transgression of the Sabbath. And we see this over and over in the Gospels that you know the religious leaders uh, and others, but the religious leaders chiefly, could not see beyond the manner in which Christ was working his miracles because he didn't conform to the categories that they thought that God should, you know, fall into. He didn't do things in the way that they expected, that they had conceived of it. You know, I, uh, it often reminds me of the phrase that maybe some of you have also heard, when people say, well, my God would never do something like that, or my God isn't like that. Uh, you know, and you can even be speaking to two Christians, you know, even two people that are Orthodox, and you hear this kind of phrase. And, you know, to be frank, what does your vision of your God have to do with who he actually is? If he's a being that exists, if he's a person, as we confess, uh, you know, three persons in, in the case of the Holy Trinity, then what relationship at all does that have to do with uh, how we conceive of him? He is who he is. And it's our responsibility to discover 
who he is. And, uh, and then to conform our ideas to him, not the other way around. He's not some kind of Play-Doh that we kind of mold a, a sculpture of that, uh, you know, justifies us being able to act however we want. But this is what we see reflected in the Jews, because they had begun to construct a view of God that didn't actually conform to who he was and who he revealed himself to be. And when faced with that reality, these miracles, for example, they didn't focus on the miracle. They focused on the fact that he did not conform to the ideas that they had created about him. And so we have to be very careful about this as well. You know, we have to be constantly sort of testing our, our, our views on God to sort of, sort of figure out, are we taking these from the revealed truth of the church, or are we taking these, you know, from the things that we're reading or the things that we're watching on television or the things that we're sort of hearing all around us without realizing um, that, we're, that we're just sort of absorbing them like a sponge. And so I'll just mention that sort of by way of commenting on, on the Jews in, on this passage. Now, the final two verses of the, of the scriptural reading for Sunday are very important, so I'll read these as well. Verses 14 to 16. Afterwards, Jesus findeth the paralytic in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him whole. Uh, this passage right here sort of brings all of it to, to the forefront. This passage of, Behold, you're healed. Don't sin any more lest a worse thing happen to you. And so the, the fathers naturally ask the question on our behalf, as we could think of, are all illness the result of sin? Because in this passage, that seems to be what the Lord is saying. Don't sin anymore, lest a worse thing should happen to you. And there's, we see in this case some connection to the, the, the illness of the man uh, and sin. Whereas in the case that we'll see in another few weeks of the man who was born blind, when the, the disciples ask, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And our Lord says, neither. You know, the, this was so that the glory of God could be made manifest, i.e. that Jesus would come and heal this person. And so the fathers sort of point out that it's a bit, uh, and you'd see this reading the different sources of the Synaxarian, the different fathers on this, this point, that our illness is the result of sin in one way, yes, and in another way, no. And so let's just sort of maybe quickly see the yes and the no of it. Well, in the first case, it's yes, because illness, death, corruption, all of these things, the you know, natural disasters, the problem, all these kinds of things are a result of the fall of man, are a result of sin entering into the world and the corruption that uh, correspondingly takes place. And so, yes, you know, illness is a result of sin, but not in the way that we're thinking of it necessarily in a sort of direct relationship, but rather as a result of uh, the corruption that exists in the world as a result of human sin having entered it. So that's the first way. Now, there's another way in which we can say, yes, that not all illnesses, but certain illnesses are uh, a result of sin. Because some sins are given to us, or not sins, rather, illnesses, or temptations, but illnesses, we'll say in this particular context, are given to us by God, as I've already said before, as an expert physician who wants to heal us. In this case, what, what would our Lord be healing of us from in the case of illness? Well, many times he's healing our pride. There's nothing so humbling as to put all the stock in your bodily strength and all of the things you can do and all the ways you can run around and be busy and forget about God and then suddenly have all of that stop in a moment because of some kind of an illness you know, whether significant or even whether small, and you suddenly realize the frailty of what it means to be a human being and the frailty of this life and how quickly uh, this life can pass away from us and slip away from us. 
And, you know, our, our Lord allows this many times because this is the means, the most effective means, and sometimes the only means, uh, by which he is able to, to humble our souls significantly in order for this to be achieved. Now, um, ultimately, the, our Lord is thinking in this case, better to give a person some temporal affliction and yet save his soul rather than that he would um, not visit this, that the soul and the sin and the pride, uh, rather the, the pride and the sin would continue to sort of infect the soul to such a degree um, that the person won't be saved. And so many times he will visit us with these things in order for us to be purified, in order to help us remove these things. Because when we have this affliction many times it's easier for us to cut off passions and to cut off sins. Because uh, when our body is weak, when we're sick, for example, you know, think of yourself when you have the flu, you don't want to eat, uh, you know, you're not interested in, you know, running around and uh, being busy and doing all of these things that don't matter. We can't concentrate on those things in those moments. And that's part of the virtue of it. Uh, yes, we can get to the point where in our sickness, you know, we can't even do the basic things of prayer or things like that, but those are moments when we can cry out to God. And again, we can still draw closer in that way. So, um, so in that way, yes, we can also say that illness can be a result of sin, the sort of general sort of condition or state. But God also gives illness, as we see from the lives of the saints, to people that he, that he wants to glorify. To his saints, for example, we think of the righteous Job. He was, uh, it was because he was favored by God that God wanted to demonstrate his glory by sort of showing, look how valiant he will be in the struggle. And you can do anything you want to him. Uh, and we see this many times with the saints. You can do whatever you want, and that God will sort of say to the devil, do your worst, as it were, because he already knows that it's going to turn into crowns for them, that their perseverance and their patience will turn into crowns, and that it will put you know, the various scoffers, and, uh, and, and the devil to scorn, as it were. You know, think of those cases where you've met someone who uh, is enduring a great kind of suffering and yet is enduring it with patience, is even enjoying it uh, joyfully, maybe in the face of great illness or great suffering or death even. You know, uh, in the times in my life when I've experienced that, I've experienced in myself feelings of shame for all the times that I blow out of proportion the things that I think are so difficult in my life. And the reaction after that oftentimes and maybe simultaneously is humility, that I'm humbled by it. And sometimes I'm even given strength by it because I think if he can endure that or she can endure that, then I can, you know, do something at least that I, you know, I can help to, uh, uh, that, I, that I won't give up basically. And so in that way, illness uh, isn't tied to sin, but rather is tied to the glorification of the person or to the saint or, or whoever. Now the final way that uh, the illness, maybe the final way I could think of say off the top, that the illness comes is, can also come from the practice of sin in the sort of habitual practice of it. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, through uh, the abuse of our bodies, through gluttony, you know, through uh, living a life of fornication, through a life of drunkenness. You know, we have to expect illnesses. We have to expect diseases. And we have to expect that our bodies will be ruined. If we continue to engage in this, these kinds of passions indiscriminately, um, because that's what they generally tend to do. We practice to the excess to which they actually destroy the body. And this particular point, both Blessed Theophilact as well as the Synaxarian make a, make a point to mention in their commentary on that. So I think it's, this one's a particularly significant one that, that we fall into, that, you know, that uh, illness can be tied to sin, not because God is visiting on it or even allowing it per se, but because we ourselves are choosing it and, and choosing to sort of remain in it. So in that sense, we can say sin, or, or rather illness, is and it isn't. Uh, the result of sin, depending on each situation. And so it's for this reason that we have to be very careful not to judge 
when we see someone sick or when we see someone with a particular temptation uh, and think uh, or be scandalized over it and think, oh, this is a judgment of God against this person, oh, this person must be a sinner, oh, these kinds of things. Because we don't know what's motivating it. We haven't had any clue. Because we're not God and we can't see into their souls. And we may think we have some insight, but we can't know that. Perfect example. Um, there's a this sort of beautiful woman, older woman, come to find out she pretty much was, you know, one of the most ascetical people probably I've ever known, even though I didn't know it. Um, but I, I learned this from my uh, priest in Thessaloniki. There was this woman who, uh, during uh, Great Lent, maybe it was even during Holy Week, I don't remember, she was coming home from other services. She gets, she's, you know, very old and very frail, and she uh, gets hit by a motorcycle and dies, you know. And the, the priest there made a, a, a point of saying, don't be scandalized by this. Don't think, don't fall into this way of thinking to think God is somehow punishing this person. You don't have any idea. And as it came out after the fact, what we saw was that actually this woman, was she'd lived alone for 40 or 50 years. You know, when you went into her home, there was nothing. She had hardly ate anything. Uh, and the only thing she had were her icons, you know, were all of these, uh, you know, different kind of religious items that she had collected, all this work that she had done, all this prayer that she was sort of consumed with. And so you come to find out, no, that there's a different reason here. You know, we can't ultimately know the causes of these things, but we can't say it's because, oh, this person was evil or sinful that these bad things happen. Don't, we just can't fall into, into that way of thinking. We just have to, as much as possible, adopt the attitude of the paralytic, an attitude of patience, of faith, uh, not, not one of grumbling or complaining, and, and of, you know, humility, and, and think, well, if God is visiting me with this, then it must be for my good. And then do the soul searching to sort of see, well, where are the areas of my life where maybe I have caused this or I'm contributing to it? And, and then what can I do, you know, what steps can I take spiritually, uh, especially with the help of a guide, in order to start the process of this sort of healing? Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll just stop us there uh, and just sort of say... Uh, Let's not become complacent, even if we feel as though we've been trapped for 38 long years, paralyzed in, uh, in our sins. But rather, let us strive always to respond to our Lord's question, do you want to be healed, with a resounding, yes, Lord, and to cry out for this healing, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Amen. Hopefully that... Came through. Interest of time, uh, maybe just one or two questions maximum. Sure. Yeah. Anyone? Sorry. All right. Come right over here. Okay. I apologize if you covered this and I just didn't grasp it. Uh, I'm going to give an example first, and then I'll ask my question. Okay. Uh, my, my spiritual father told me that I had to go through... I was asking why I was going through something. Mm. I just said I had to go through that in order to become aware of who I am. It, it, will, it will help to bring out what my passions are and it will help me realize who I am. Mm. And I'm actually finding this very, very hard. So you kind of touched on this about having the thoughts about, you know, just questioning things. So I automatically question these things and I think to myself, well, why does it have to be something so hard? Or how come... Somebody else who goes through something a lot smaller and come to the realization of who they are. So mm. my question, my question is, how do we like stop these questions and how do we just come to accept what the answer is? Like the answer of, I have to go through this to realize who I am. Yeah. <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> no, it it does. You know. Um, I guess the the first thing I would say in terms of how to stop the thoughts are, you know, by re finding examples of people who you know probably in your own life or around you or situations like someone like this paralytic who's laid up for 38 years you know when we put ourselves and we start to think about the real kind of suffering that people are going through right now you know uh, 
while it doesn't necessarily change sort of objectively, you know, the difficulties we are struggling with, you know, personally or, or whatever in order to sort of to come to a deeper sort of self-awareness and self-knowledge, man, it sure can make bearing it a little bit easier. You know, what if you were the parent of one of these, you know, girls that has been kidnapped to be sold off, you know, at whatever age to be married? Uh, I mean, there are really trials that go on in the world, uh, and not around the world, in our parish, and people next to you in your work, all these different kinds of things. And again, I don't mean to use sort of some extreme example to therefore say, oh, so just sort of we need to just clam up before these examples, but to really sort of use them as a way to say, uh, you know, thank you, God, for visiting me with what you've given to me because that situation I can't imagine having to struggle with. Uh, or, you know, it could be ways that we begin by sort of, uh, you know, just sort of reflecting on the uh, on the, the general sadness that I struggle with the things I struggle with and that these people somewhere else and that someone else is struggling. And it can be, it can sort of bubble out into not just prayer sort of for ourselves and focusing on the sort of difficult thing we're struggling with, but rather... Uh, it can become something more positive in terms of the way that we're struggling with uh, with this particular trial um, because we end up embracing this, the, the difficulties of other people. And in doing that, it's still benefiting our, ourselves. If we sort of connect our salvation to the salvation of the people around us uh, and are more aware of that, it becomes easier to suffer because it's sort of like saying, well, I'll do my part, Lord, uh, if this is somehow going to make me better able to help these other people who don't have any any way of or any means of help you know thoughts like that I mean it's thoughts are the with thoughts I always think of it sort of as a game you know it's a bloody struggle it's warfare you can call it a hundred different names but I always think of it also as a game it's this game where the the thought suggests one thing to you or the demon suggests one thing to you and you you just respond back to them with whatever any means that you can to sort of silence them, whatever you need to say to tell them to shut up, basically, until we can get to the point where we can just sort of ignore them, uh, you know, and uh, and go to the, the Jesus prayer, or go to go to prayer, and, and leave them behind altogether, where they, they're like sort of flies buzzing around us, I think is the Pisces of the Holy Mountain says. I don't know, that helps, I think that answers more the, the sort of second part of your question, maybe rather than the... And the first, why we have to go through with it is, I think, just the sort of simple aspect of, you know, unfortunately, we have particular sicknesses, and God knows, you know, we don't always know, but that this is going to be the best way to cure us. So it might seem difficult, but if you sort of think beyond the momentary difficulties to, yeah, it stinks, you know, it stinks, I just had surgery, and I have to go through physio, and I have to wait six weeks and everything. But at the end of it, it was the best way for me to be healed. You know, at the end of it, it's going to achieve the goal. And if we think more to the end goal in these moments, especially when we're feeling oppressed um, by the struggle, then it can give us a little more caragio, better, uh, you know, strength for it. We got one more, one more question. We should finish. Pa, thank you so much for uh, giving us the Yomilia again. And uh, I think it was through God's providence. I want to believe that we had all these temptations so that when he did give the homily, finally, that if we can't be patient with some small technical difficulties, then we can't be looking within ourselves uh, how much more work we need to do. So mess everything is within God's providence. So thank you so much, and God willing, we'll, we'll see you very soon. God willing. Great. Thank God. This is from Susan Nesti. And if it's a nasty, we'll sing it again. Christos Anesti Ek Nekron Thanato Thanato Patisas Joy in
Thank you. Thank you.